So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Harvey Riyan with us today from DMTP in Cambridge University. We all know the works of Professor Riel, and uh, today will be another work which we are all eager to hear from him, namely the well posedness and causality in effective field theories in gravitation, I mean, in GR and also beyond. So without any further ado, let us welcome Professor Harvey Riel for this talk. And uh, thank you very much, Professor Riel, for accepting our invitation. Please, the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so uh, I'll be talking today about work I've been doing over the last few years with my students. So most of this talk will be about work I did with uh, my former student, Aaron Kovach, who's now a postdoc in, in Trieste. Um, towards the end of my talk, I will say something about this, uh, this work from about a year ago. And I'll also touch on a, on a recent paper I wrote with another student, um, Ian Davis. Um, so let me start with some motivation. Uh, so the detection of gravitational waves from black hole or neutron star mergers is an opportunity to perform precision tests of GR in the strong field, highly dynamical regime. Um, so to do this, we need theoretical predictions for how a deviation from GR would affect the gravitational waves emitted in a, in a merger. Uh, today, I'm mostly going to focus on black hole, black hole mergers, uh, just because it's cleaner. I don't have to worry about the matter inside a neutron star. So we're going to be looking for deviations from GR in vacuum. Um, so there are two problems in carrying out this program. So first, in order to look for deviations from GR, we need to be using some theory of, of modified gravity. Um, but the question then is which theory should we use to make our predictions? Um, and secondly, uh, to make predictions, we need to perform numerical simulations. In particular, the gravitational wave signal is strongest. And if we want to make predictions about the moment of merger, uh, the only way we know how to do that is, is using numerical simulation. But in order to um, do numerical simulations, this requires that the theory um, that you're studying admits a well-posed initial value problem, um, which basically means the following. It means that if you're given suitable initial data, then there should exist a unique, at least up to diffeomorphisms, uh, solution of the equations of motion that uh, depends continuously on the initial data. And, and this last point sounds technical, but it's very important in, in practice because um, any numerical simulation will, will have some numerical error present in the initial data. And if your solution did not depend continuously on the initial data, then that small error in the data could give you a massive error in the solution. So, so this is a crucial property in, in practice. So that, that's, the, the, that's what we require for, for well-posedness of the initial value problem. Um, so let me discuss this, this first problem, which theory should we use? So this is where effective field theory comes in because effective field theory provides a way of studying um, small deviations from GR, which is agnostic about whatever the source of the unknown UV short distance high energy physics is that, that causes this deviation. And I should say that all of the observations we have of gravitational waves so far all seem to be in, in good qualitative agreement with GR. And so if there is going to be any deviation, I think it's pretty likely it's going to be a small deviation. And so this seems like a reasonable thing to, to, to use. Um, so in effective field theory, the basic approach is to, to say, what, what are the light fields present in your, your theory? So this means what are, the, what are the fields whose masses are small compared to the scale of this UV physics? And you then write down the most general Lagrangian for these light fields as an expansion in terms with um, increasing numbers of derivatives. So in the simplest example, we just look at vacuum gravity where we just have the metric as our only light field. We write down the most general Lagrangian, increasing numbers of derivatives for the metric. We start off with zero derivatives, which gives us the cosmological constant. And two derivatives with the Einstein-Hilbert term. And then there are uh, terms we can write down with four derivatives. Four derivatives. These are terms which are um, quadratic in curvature. Um, so, so there are three possible terms one can write down which are quadratic in curvature. Uh, which of these three terms I've written here? There's Ricci scalar squared, Ricci tensor squared. And this thing LGB is the um, Euler density associated with the Gauss-Bonnet invariant, 
it's convenient just to package things in this way for, for reasons that will become um, apparent. And these, these terms are multiplied by dimension for coefficients, alpha, beta, gamma. Um, in effect, the field theory, one expects the, those coefficients to be, um, the size of those coefficients to be set by the, the scale at which the UV physics appears. And so you'd expect alpha, beta, gamma to be um, proportional to L squared, where L is the length scale associated with UV physics. So, so below, below the scale, L is where you start to see deviations from, um, from GR. Um, okay, so here's our Lagrangian again. Um, so this is, of course, an expansion in an increasing numbers of derivatives. And that only makes sense if the, um, the high derivative terms become increasingly less important. Uh, so we need the, these terms with six derivatives, eight derivatives, and so on to be less important than the terms we've written down. And that will be the case provided gradients are small on the scale set by L. And in particular, we need curvature to be small on this, on this scale, uh, L to the minus two. Um, so if this is true, then the high derivative terms are going to be small compared to, to the lower derivative terms. And in particular, these, these four derivative terms will be small compared to the terms coming from the Einstein-Hilbert um, term in this regime. So I call this the, the weakly coupled regime. It's the regime where we're looking at small corrections to, to conventional GR. Um, and there's a natural extension to, of, of this terminology uh, when we have matter fields present as well. Um, so this, this assumption that we're in this weakly coupled regime, I should emphasize, is completely compatible with, with strong field black hole dynamics, um, provided we're looking at black holes which are large compared to this scale L, so that their curvature is small compared to that scale. Um, <clears throat> now, in order for this to be observable, this scale L is going to have to be something comparable to the size of the black holes, which are observed in, 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 in gravitational wave observations. So L would be, need to be a uh, kilometer scale or not much smaller. Of course, this seems incredibly unlikely from the perspective of fundamental theory. Um, so that, that's one reason why most people don't expect to see a deviation from GR. Um, but I think there's another way of looking at this, which is that if we want to um, parameterize our tests of strong field GR, if we want to say how well we've tested GR, we could formulate it in terms of these coefficients, alpha, beta, gamma. So we could um, parameterize a test of GR by putting upper bounds on these, on these coefficients. And the stronger the upper bound, the better we've tested GR. So in some way, that's perhaps analogous to the, the PPN formalism, which is used for, for weak field tests of GR. So maybe that's one reason for thinking about things in these, in these terms. Um, okay, so we're looking at a Lagrangian involving uh, high derivatives in this effective field theory. Um, we don't want to deal with an infinite Lagrangian, so we need to truncate it at, at some order of derivatives. Um, but the problem with doing that is that then the resulting equations of motion are going to involve terms with higher than second derivatives of the fields. And this is problematic for two reasons, at least two reasons. One is that, um, as I've said, well-posedness is important. The well-posedness of the initial value problem is determined mainly uh, by the terms in the equations of motion with the, the highest numbers of derivatives. Okay, so these terms, in order for the equations to be well-posed, these terms have to have a, a nice structure in some sense. They have to have a nice algebraic structure. Um, but in fact, but in, practice, there's no reason that this structure will actually be present. And in fact, in, in effective field theory, these, these terms with the most derivatives are the ones which should be the least important, not the most important. And so you see there's some tension here between the physics of effective field theory and the mathematics of well-posedness, whereas for well-posedness, it's the terms with the most derivatives which are the most important, whereas in effective field theory, those terms should be the least important. So there's a, there's a tension there. Uh, even if we could resolve that tension, we still have this, this second problem, which is that with higher order equations, we would need to specify uh, additional initial data. And specifying initial additional initial data would correspond to uh, additional degrees of freedom, um, which, which should not be present in our effective field theory. The effective field theory should only describe the, the light fields we started from. Uh, so if we just have the metric present, that, that should just have the normal number of degrees of freedom of the metric. We shouldn't have any extra degrees of freedom. Um, so these are problems. Sorry, I don't can I ask a question, please? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, 
when you say heavy degrees of freedom, I'm a bit confused because what if you just have massless fields like gravity and maybe uh, electromagnetism? There's no, what, so, so is there another meaning of heavy? I mean, it's not in terms well, well, of- What I mean is that um, if you work with the higher order equations, um, then they have, you need to specify additional initial data, which means there are extra degrees of freedom present beyond the ones that you, you thought were present. And if you look at the solutions uh, associated to those extra degrees of freedom, they tend to exhibit rapid oscillations, which are on the, on the scale of the, of the UV parameter L, which is why I'm calling them heavy degrees of freedom. You're, you're right. If, if I just say, if I start with, um, I write down the effective field theory for Einstein-Maxwell theory, there should just be, um, there should be four degrees of freedom, right? There should be uh, two metric degrees of freedom and two Maxwell degrees of freedom. Right. That should be all there right. is. And so right. I, should only, I, I should only be specifying the normal amount of initial data for those four degrees of freedom. That, that, that's the point I'm making. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so the, yeah, again, so again, the physics seems to, 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 seems to be in tension with the mathematics at this point um, for both of these reasons. Fortunately, so I don't know how to solve these problems, but, but fortunately for, for several theories of interest, if we're only interested in the, in the leading order effective field theory corrections, then we can write them in a way that sidesteps both of these problems. So let me explain that. So the trick is to, to exploit uh, the freedom to perform field redefinitions in effective field theory. Um, so for example, an example of a field redefinition would be something like this, where we replace the metric by uh, the metric plus some combination of the, uh, the Ricci tensor and the Ricci scalar with, with some coefficients A and B. And by appropriately choosing these coefficients, you can simplify the form of the action. And so it's well known that you can use field redefinitions essentially to eliminate um, terms in the action, which vanish on shell. So they vanish when the equations of motion are satisfied. So in particular, if we carry this out for vacuum gravity, where, where, the, where the two derivative equation of motion would be that the Ricci tensor vanishes, this lets us eliminate terms like Ricci scalar squared and Ricci tensor squared because they vanish on, the, uh, on shell in the two derivative theory. That means they can be eliminated by these field redefinitions. And one simplifies the Lagrangian quite a lot just to this, um, this gauss bonnet term here. Um, so in... Um, in, in four dimensions, uh, things are even simpler because in four dimensions, it's, it's well known that this, this term here is topological. And so this means that in four dimensions, after doing field redefinitions, we've completely eliminated the four derivative corrections to the equations of motion. And therefore the leading corrections will start at, at six derivatives. Um, in more than four dimensions, this is no longer topological. So this, this gives us um, non-trivial corrections to, uh, to GR. And um, so the, these are the leading order effective field theory corrections to GR. These are four derivative terms. But what's remarkable, um, and the reason for writing things in terms of this particular uh, combination, is that this term still has second order equations of motion. It's, it's an example of a so-called uh, Lovelock theory. Okay, so this, this term, although it involves four derivatives in the Lagrangian, the equation of motion does not involve higher than second derivatives of the metric. And that's why we can avoid these, these problems I was just, um, just describing. Um, another example of the same phenomenon is if, if we now include another light field, let's include a scalar field. So our, our light fields in the metric and, and a scalar field. Again, we can play this game of, of making field redefinitions um, if we assume the theory has a parity symmetry, then after field redefinitions, we can bring the Lagrangian to this form, where again, we've ordered things by increasing numbers of derivatives. This is just a potential for our scalar field. This is Einstein-Hilbert. This is the kinetic term for our scalar field. Uh, this term here is quadratic in the kinetic term. So this is a four derivative term with an arbitrary coefficient evolving a, a function of phi, the scalar field. And then we see this gauss bonnet term again. So again, this is a four derivative term, but now with an arbitrary coupling constant multiplying it, an arbitrary function of the scalar field. And then over here, we have terms with six or more derivatives. Um, and this is quite an attractive uh, theory uh, the, because again, um, well, in contrast with uh, vacuum gravity in four dimensions, uh, these, this term is now non-trivial because uh, this coupling here renders it non-topological. So this is, this is non-trivial now. It affects the equations of motion. Um, it's attractive because uh, generically 
one would expect this beta to contain a term linear in phi, and with a linear term, this um, curvature term will act as a source for the scalar field. And with curvature sources the scalar field, which means that for this theory, you would be guaranteed a deviation from GR even in vacuum. Okay? You can't turn the scalar field off in the presence of curvature. Um, but finally, um, the other nice thing about this theory is if we neglect all of this stuff with more than four derivatives, then this theory again has this nice property that the equations of motion are second order. And so again, we can hope perhaps that this theory is well opposed and we, we solve these problems that we, 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 we encountered earlier. So in fact, this theory is an example of a so-called um, Hondeski theory, which is a, a theory, scalar tensor theory with second order equations of motion. Okay, so we've exploited again this freedom to do field redefinitions to bring the theory to a form which has this nice property. Uh, final example is, is Einstein and Maxwell. This is uh, appealing because it's the real world. The only fields we observe in nature, which can be described classically, are the metric and the Maxwell field. Um, and so it's interesting to write down the, the effective field theory for, for those fields. Um, again, let me assume we have a parity symmetry. And then after field redefinitions, one can bring the Lagrangian to, to this form. Again, cosmological constant, Einstein Hilbert. And then this X here is just the usual Maxwell uh, Lagrangian. And then we add these four derivative terms, X squared, Y squared here. So Y is this uh, contraction of the Maxwell field with its, uh, with its dual. These are four derivative terms. And then there's this interesting term which couples the uh, Maxwell field to the, to the Riemann tensor, uh, which one can write uh, like this. And so they come in with some coefficient C1, C2, C3, which will be proportional to the, the square of the, of the UV scale associated with, with new physics. And in practice, it's known uh, what, 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 there are examples of UV theories which give exactly these, these terms. So the simple example is just QED. If you take QED in flat space and you integrate out the electron, then you get precisely these terms here with, with particular coefficients, C1 and C2. That's the, uh, the famous Euler-Heisenberg Lagrangian. This term here is if, what you get if you integrate out the electron from QED in curved space. And so that was shown by uh, Drummond and Hathrell in the early 80s, um, at least up to this, this field redefinition business. Um, once again, uh, the leading effective field theory corrections to standard Einstein-Maxwell theory start at four derivatives. And once again, uh, by uh, using field redefinitions, we've brought the Lagrange into this particular form out of the many different ways we could have written it. And this particular form was um, chosen because it has this nice property that the equations of motion are still second order. Okay, so in particular, this term here gives second order equations of motion. Um, and when I say second order, I mean second order in derivatives of G and A, where A is the uh, vector potential for the, uh, the Maxwell field. Okay, so this is our final example of an effective field theory where, where these problems of high derivatives in the equations of motion seem to be absent. Um, Okay, so just to summarize the discussion so far, we've shown that, that I've explained that field redefinitions can be used to write uh, the four derivative terms in our effective field theory in a way that still gives second order equations of motion for various theories of interest, specifically vacuum gravity, although this was trivial in 4D, uh, the parity symmetric scalar tensor theory, and the parity symmetric Einstein Maxwell theory. <clears throat> So these then are theories that we can ask the question about, do they admit a well-posed initial value problem? At least we can return to this question of, of well-posedness. Um, so to start the discussion, let me first mention, if we, if we just think about say vacuum gravity in, in higher dimensions, if we look at the four derivative terms in the equation of motion, then they're gonna look things like this. So, so the, these are terms which don't involve higher than second derivatives, but they involve four derivatives in total. So we might have something which is quadratic in second derivatives multiplied by the square of the UV scale L, or we might have something which is linear in second derivatives multiplied by something which is quadratic in first derivatives. These are four derivative terms, but involve no more than second derivatives of the, of the metric. Um, now it's well known, well, it is known 
that uh, if these terms become comparable to the, the standard two derivative terms coming from the Einstein Hilbert Lagrangian, then well posedness can fail. So you can see this in a simple way just by looking at cosmological solutions of these theories. If you look at a FLRW solution of, of, of one of these theories, say, say um, in vacuum gravity with this gas Bonnet term, um, if you look at perturbations around a cosmological solution, the, in particular, the equation for tensor perturbations, so this is a gauge invariant equation, you find that if these terms are comparable to these terms for the background solution, then the equation for the tensor modes can change character from hyperbolic to elliptic. Elliptic equations certainly do not admit a well-posed initial value problem. And so this is why we don't expect well-posedness when these, these four derivative terms become comparable to the two derivative terms. And so in order for the, the equations to be well posed, the necessary condition is that these four derivative terms are going to have to be small compared to the two derivative terms. But that's fine because this is just this weak coupling assumption I mentioned earlier. Okay, the best we can hope for is that these theories admit a well posed initial value problem when the four derivative terms are small compared to the two derivative terms. But that's all we need in effective field theory because that, that, that's part of the uh, that's a condition for the for, for us to be within the regime of validity of effective field theory. Okay, so we're always going to be assuming that the four derivative terms are small compared to the two derivative terms. However, even with this assumption, it's still highly non-trivial that the initial value problem is well posed. Even though it looks like we're just making a small uh, adjustment to the equation, the, uh, the well posedness is still very non-trivial, um, as I as I'll explain. Can I interrupt you once again, Professor Real? Yes, please. Um, in the Einstein-Maxwell case, do you think conformal invariance, for instance, if you couple uh, the, the Maxwell field to the vial tensor, would that, would that uh, be any good? I mean, is that any better because of these extra um, that, that would be worse, actually. So it's, it is specifically this, this Riemann term here I need here right. if, if I, right. that gives us this um, second order equations of motion property. If, if I replace this with vial, which, which I can do, I mean, we're within, I can do that with a field redefinition. Field redefinitions don't care whether that's Riemann or vial. Hmm. But the reason for writing it in this form was precisely to get this second order equation of motion. Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, Okay, so let me say something about uh, well posedness. Um, so even if we're just looking at standard Einstein gravity, then the Einstein equation does not admit a well posed initial value problem. <clears throat> and that's for a reason you're all familiar with, which is that the theory has gauge freedom. Um, so part of the definition of well posedness is that there should be a unique solution, but because of gauge freedom, the solution is, is not unique. So in order to, to, to establish well posedness, we have to fix the gauge. So we have to find a good gauge condition and a good way of performing the gauge fixing. And of course, this is essential for numerics. You can't, you can't do numerical simulations unless, you've, unless you fix the gauge. Now in, in vacuum GR, the simplest um, choice of gauge and gauge fixing that gives you well posed equations is, is harmonic gauge. Um, but as I'll say a little bit more about, this, this does not work for the theories I'm talking about. It's the simplest choice for vacuum GR. If you try to use it in these theories I've been describing, it doesn't work, even in this weakly coupled regime. Okay, so this is something I showed a few years ago with my, my student, Giuseppe Papalo. And so the, the main result of, of the work, the new work, is that we, we had to um, find a new way of doing the gauge fixing. Um, so we've introduced a new family of so-called modified harmonic gauges just for conventional GR and a new way of doing the gauge fixing. <clears throat> and by doing that, we get a new formulation of the equations of motion of these effective field theories. And in fact, the whole class of Hondeski or Lovelock theories uh, that admits a well-posed initial value problem in this weakly coupled regime I've, I've described. Okay. So we, we solve the problem of well-posedness in this way. And uh, this formulation has been successfully used to do numerical simulations of black hole mergers in these, in these theories. So let me describe uh, this now in, in a little bit more detail. So what do we mean? What do we need for well posedness? So this is a mathematical property. So we need some mathematical condition on our equation that guarantees well posedness. And a, a sufficient condition for a well posed initial value problem is that the equation you're dealing with is, is so-called strongly hyperbolic equation. 
So let me explain what that means just in a, in a simple example. Let's consider a, a first order linear constant coefficient system. So an equation of this form where u here is a, is a vector, let's say it's an n component vector of fields. And the mi here is an n by n matrix and n here is also an n by n matrix. This i here refers to the, the spatial coordinates and this, um, oops, what have I got? Uh, this t here is, is just the time coordinate. Okay, so the constant coefficients means that these matrices m, i, and n are just constant. They don't depend on the coordinates. So this is, this is very easy to solve with a Fourier transform. We take a Fourier transform with respect to the spatial variables. We get a first order ODE in time. We solve that ODE, and then we invert the Fourier transform, and we get to this, this formal solution of this, of this system here. So here, psi here is, is our wave vector in Fourier space. So here, this is just the usual plane wave you see in, in the Fourier transform. Um, this, uh, this is a matrix. This is an exponential of a matrix. You can see these M and this N sitting up here. The M is now contracted with, with psi, the wave vector. And this is the Fourier transform of our initial data. So now this is, this is a formal solution. But now we have to ask, is this formal solution actually a solution? In other words, does this integral converge? And we're interested in convergence for large psi, in other words, short distance or, or high frequency. Um, so we want this integral to converge without us having to make overly restrictive conditions on our initial data. So to do that, we have to be able to control what this matrix exponential is doing. And as I said, the, the, the issue is convergence at large psi, and at large psi, this term here, the first term in the exponent is going to dominate over this n. And so convergence is, is guaranteed if we can bound this matrix exponential in terms of psi. So if we can get an upper bound on this uh, uniformly in psi, in other words, if we can bound this where the bound is independent of psi, then that's sufficient to guarantee convergence of this integral. So we're looking for a bound of, of this form as psi goes to infinity. So it's not too hard to show that um, this is true if and only if um, the, this matrix M contracted with psi, uh, so this is an N by N matrix, this matrix has to be diagonalizable with real eigenvalues. If the eigenvalues were not real, the left-hand side here would grow exponentially with psi. And if this matrix were not diagonalizable, the left-hand side would grow polynomially with psi. Okay, so we need this matrix MI psi I to be diagonalizable with real eigenvalues. These eigenvalues, incidentally, are, are simply the phase velocities of the plane wave solutions of the, of the original systems. So this is basically the definition of strong hyperbolicity, that this condition is true, that we have this diagonalizability with, with real eigenvalues for this, this matrix, for any psi. Um, and in fact, although I did this for constant coefficients, the same definition goes is, is made when the coefficients are not constant. The intuition here is that this, I, I told you this is a large psi effect. Large psi, roughly speaking, corresponds to short distances. And at short distances, any, any variation in these coefficients, you might think is, is negligible. So that's, that's the intuition behind why that the same definition applies when the coefficients are not constant. Um, there's, a, there's a related definition of weakly hyperbolic, which is where we drop this diagonalizability condition and we just demand the real eigenvalues. Okay. So that, that's something um, that, 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 that I'll mention, but um, this is not sufficient for strong hyperbolicity. Sorry, this is not sufficient for, for well posedness. Strong hyperbolicity is what we need for well posedness. Uh, if we're dealing with a second order system, then the trick is to reduce it to first order form and then apply this, this definition. And if we're dealing with nonlinear equations, then you can use the same kind of definition, um, but applied to the equations linearized around a, a generic background. So in our case, that will be a generic weakly coupled background. So we would take a, a generic weakly coupled background solution of our, of our theory, and then demand that the equations when linearized around any such background satisfy this, this definition. Um, Okay, so um, let me say a few words about just the, the philosophy here uh, in what, what makes gravitational theory special in, in this context of well posedness. Uh, let me warm up by just thinking about electromagnetism. So, in electromagnetism, we can consider nonlinear generalizations of Maxwell's theory, where we have a Lagrangian of this form, where X is just the usual Maxwell Lagrangian, 
And Y is the, the Y I defined earlier, the contraction of, of F with F dual. Um, so this Lagrangian gives us first order equations of motion for the, the Maxwell tensor F mu nu. And the, the point I want to emphasize is that, that these equations are modulo a few small subtleties. These equations are, are either well posed or they're not. There isn't, there isn't much you can do uh, to, to fiddle with them. On the other hand, in a gravitational theory, this is no longer true. And the reason it's not true is that we don't have gauge invariant quantities analogous to F mu nu. So as I said earlier, the equations of motion are not hyperbolic because of the diffeomorphism symmetry. And in order to make them hyperbolic, we have to fix the gauge. But whether or not the gauge fixed equations are hyperbolic depends on the choice of gauge. And the same would be true, in fact, for electromagnetism if we work with a vector potential rather than working with this gauge invariant quantity F mu nu. So the question we need to ask, or we need to answer, is that does there exist any gauge fixing that does give us strongly hyperbolic equations? Okay, so we, it's not just write down the equations and ask, are they well posed? We have to ask, can we find a gauge condition such that when we write down the equations, they give us a well posed initial value problem? And the answer in conventional GR is, is, of course, yes, we could use harmonic coordinates or numerical simulations are often used the, the so-called BSSM formulation, which is um, uh, more fancy. But again, it's, it's basically the same idea. It's some way of gauge fixing the theory that gives a strongly hyperbolic system. Yeah. yeah. Is there a question? University of Mathematics. Is there a question? I'll continue. Um, so the, um, our strategy then for, um, for proving, well, the general strategy for proving well posedness in just in conventional GR is the following. First, you, you need to find a way of gauge fixing to give strongly hyperbolic equations of motion. Um, that then ensures uh, that the equations are well posed um, for, the, the initial value problem will be well posed because, because the equations are strongly hyperbolic. And I want to emphasize that this well-posedness holds for any initial data. It holds even for initial data that violates the constraint equations or the gauge condition. Okay, so the gauge fixed equations, the well-posedness means that they're well-posed for any initial data. And of course, this is important in numerics because numerically you could never satisfy the gauge condition and the constraints exactly. And so you have to be able to evolve data which doesn't satisfy it exactly. So that's, that's point one. Point two, is that you then want to show that if your initial data does satisfy the constraints and the gauge condition, then, is there a question? If the initial data does satisfy the constraints and the gauge condition, then in the resulting solution, the gauge fixing terms vanish. And so one obtains a solution of the original non-gauge fixed equation. I think someone needs to turn their microphone off unless there's a question. Um, okay, so that's that's the strategy in, in gravitational theories for, for proving well posedness. This is, but this is step one, which is the, is the difficult step, is, is doing the gauge fixing. So let me briefly describe how the harmonic gauge works in, in conventional GR. So in conventional GR, um, harmonic gauge is defined as follows. So we consider the wave operator acting on the coordinates. Let me call that H mu. Um, that's easy to see. This is the same thing as the as the contraction of the Christoffel symbols. I'm very sorry, uh, Professor Rial. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit confused. I mean, when you say it's not gauge invariant, the Ricci scalar, uh, according to you, isn't gauge invariant, is it? Or... No, it's not. I mean, it is. It's, it's gauge invariant if you well, it's gauge invariant if you linearize around flat space, but it's not gauge invariant in a in a general background. No. I mean, if you do oh, a different, oh, so you mean you mean gauge invariant with respect to a general background? Is that so? You're always always splitting it into a background plus fluctuation. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, the point is, I um, I mean, as I said, one, one way of thinking about this is is that you you need your equations to be nice when linearized around an arbitrary background, a generic background. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, one way of thinking about it is for a generic background, you don't have um, gauge invariant uh, variables for for GR. Uh, there's a there's an approach in field theory called background gauge method. Now, uh, does that does that make any difference in this case? Um, uh, I mean, you could. If I knew what that approach was, I could probably answer your question, but I suspect the answer is no. 
Um, I see. Because see, for me, gauge invariant is always a matter of convenience. The whole theory and physical predictions must be gauge invariant, right? Uh, correct. Yeah. The, but the point is that, that the notion of well posedness is not. Um, so notion of well posedness uh, applies to the gauge fixed equations. And so the strategy is first you have to find a nice way of gauge fixing to give you a well posed initial value problem. You then prove well posedness in well, that gauge. Yeah, and I you can then transform to whatever other gauge you want to then work in to, to answer questions in, in a more general gauge. So my question is actually the following. I mean, is this a question of principle or a matter of convenience? Uh, the harmonic uh, gauge choice, for instance. Is it because we, we, if things become hard in other gauges and strong hyperbolicity is not obvious in other gauges? or what is no, it? No, other gauge, no, it's not that it's not obvious, that it's not true. So, I mean, a simple example is in, in conventional GR is the ADM equations. If you just do the, the three plus one splitting in GR, you write down the ADM equations. And it's well known that gives you a set of equations which are weakly hyperbolic, but not strongly hyperbolic. Um, so that, that they, those equations would not be good enough. Uh, and in fact, I think that's one of the reasons people had trouble doing numerical simulations in GR for so long, which is that they were trying to use equations which, which did not admit a well-posed initial value problem. So this, this BSSN formulation is, a, is a, an improvement of those equations, which is strongly hyperbolic. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, so harmonic gauge is defined by, by this equation. Um, since this just involves evol solving a wave equation for the coordinates, this, this gauge condition, of course, can always be imposed. Um, we then do the gauge fixing as follows. So if we're just looking at vacuum gravity, the equation will be r mu nu equals zero. But we now change that by adding this gauge fixing term uh, like this. And let's call that e mu nu. So e mu nu equal to zero is our gauge fixed equation. So the reason for adding this particular term is that it, if you look at the, um, the highest derivative terms in this, in this combination, they're exactly just the wave operator acting on the, on the metric. Okay, so this stuff here doesn't depend on second derivatives. Um, so because it's just the wave operator acting on the metric, uh, this, this equation is strongly hyperbolic. And so this equation, e mu nu equal to zero, the harmonic gauge Einstein equation admits a well-posed initial value problem. What you can then do is if you take the divergence of this equation and use the fact that r mu nu satisfies the Bianchi identity, you can get an equation for H. So you get a homogeneous linear equation for H, which schematically looks like this. It's a, it's a wave equation for H. Um, because this is a, a wave equation, it, this equation also has a well-posed initial value problem. And then you, one can show that if the initial data satisfies the gauge condition, in other words, if H mu vanishes initially, and the constraints are satisfied initially, then the only solution of this equation is h mu is identically zero. And therefore, this, the solution of, of this equation is the same as r mu nu equal to zero. It's the same as the conventional Einstein equation. So that, that's how things work in, in standard uh, GR. Um, so let's now go on to uh, the theories I've been talking about, these effective field theories. Um, let's take this scalar tensor theory as an example. Um, so in the scalar tensor theory, one could imagine generalizing the gauge condition by adding a source term for H, which depends on the scalar field phi, so something like this. Um, so you can then ask, can we choose this source term such that when we do this gauge fixing, then the, we get a strongly hyperbolic set of equations? And the answer is no. So this is what I showed a few years ago with my, my student. We proved that there's no choice for this source term uh, which would give you strongly hyperbolic equations for this um, scalar tensor effective field theory with these four derivative terms in, in the Lagrangian. Okay, so in the, in the two derivative scalar tensor theory, just conventional scalar tensor theory, this would be fine, but in the four derivative theory, this doesn't work. So you get systems which are weakly hyperbolic, but not strongly hyperbolic. And the reason why well, the problem can be traced back to uh, the following, which you can see at the linearized level, which is that the, um, the gauge fixed equation of motion admits two types of unphysical solutions. Okay? So one is that the gauge fixed equation uh, still has a residual gauge symmetry. So there are, there are um, solutions arising from a gauge transformation, which still satisfy the gauge condition, provided this, this gauge parameter psi uh, satisfies the wave equation. Okay? So that's a, a residual gauge invariance of the gauge fixed equations. 
And the second thing is that, as, as I emphasized earlier, the gauge fixed equation lets you propagate solutions which don't satisfy the gauge condition. And so there are unphysical solutions which don't satisfy, they're unphysical because they don't satisfy the gauge condition. They have non-zero H. Okay, so these are the two types of unphysical solution of the gauge fixed equation. Now, if we look at a conventional Einstein scalar theory, by which I mean just a two derivative theory, so just Einstein gravity minimally coupled to a scalar field, then that conventional theory is strongly hyperbolic in a harmonic gauge. And remember, strongly hyperbolic meant that this matrix I discussed earlier had to be diagonalizable with real eigenvalues. And it is, it's just a conventional theory. But I want to emphasize that the eigenvalues of this matrix are degenerate, okay? I told you these eigenvalues are the phase velocities of the modes. In conventional Einstein scalar theory, the phase velocities are all one. Okay? And that's why this matrix is degenerate. The eigenvalues are all equal. And this degeneracy causes a problem when we go to include the four derivative terms. So if we now go to our effective field theory where we include these four derivative terms, remember these are small terms. We're treating them as a small deformation of the equation. And so they're going to give us a small deformation of this matrix. And now the problem is that if we make a generic deformation of a matrix with degenerate eigenvalues, then that, that deformation will not be diagonalizable. Okay, so this degenerate eigenvalues means that when we do the deformation, it causes non-trivial Jordan blocks to form. Okay, so the eigenvectors can mix up and diagonal diagonalizability is ruined when we deform the theory. So these Jordan blocks are associated precisely with these subspaces spanned by the eigenvectors uh, associated with this pure gauge and gauge condition violating modes of the two derivative theory. So the, these unphysical modes are, are described down here. Okay, so they're what, what's causing the problem. So the new idea then is in the newer work is to, is to try and deform our gauge fixing procedure to separate these modes to eliminate this degeneracy. So we want to separate the speeds of these unphysical modes in the two derivative theory, such that when we then include the four derivative terms, when we deform the theory, uh, once we've separated the eigenvalues, when we deform the theory, this matrix will then remain diagonalizable because if the eigenvalues are distinct, when you deform it, uh, they have to remain distinct. Okay, so that's the idea. So how does it work? Um, so here's, here's, the, here's the idea. Um, so our, this is our what we call modified harmonic gauge. So our, our gauge fixing depends on introducing two more metrics. So I, I want to emphasize these two metrics are completely unphysical. Um, they're entirely here to do the gauge fixing. Okay, so they're called G, G tilde and G hat. So the first thing is we do we do is we modify our harmonic gauge condition. So the harmonic gauge condition was basically uh, this where we had a metric G sitting here. So what we've done is we've replaced that G by G tilde, or equivalently, we're now taking the trace of the Christoffel symbols with respect to G tilde. The Christoffel symbols are still fully determined by G, G tilde is just sitting here. Okay, so that's our modified gauge condition. The second thing we do is we modify the gauge fixing term. So this is our, our gauge fixed equation of motion. You see we have these derivatives of H just as we had before, and they're contracted with this tensor, which we've called P hat. P hat looks like this, and it involves this, this other unphysical metric G hat. Now, if this G hat were G, then this would just be the usual harmonic gauge of conventional GR. So it's, it's the fact that this is a G hat and not a G, which is different. Um, if we take a divergence of this gauge fixed equation, it implies that H now satisfies a wave equation as before, but now with respect to this unphysical metric G hat. And so the upshot of all of this is it means that if we look at the linearized theory, linearized around a solution just in conventional GR, then pure gauge solutions will propagate along the, the null cone of this G tilde, um, whereas conditions that get modes which violate the gauge condition will propagate along the null cone of G hat because of this equation. And so we've separated the, the speeds of G tilde and G hat because they're propagating along, uh, we've separated the speeds of these two types of unphysical mode because they're propagating along these different cones. All of this is unphysical. These are, these are unphysical degrees of freedom. The physical degrees of freedom still propagate along the null cone of the physical metric G mu nu. Okay. So um, we've got these two unphysical metrics, G tilde and G hat. How do we choose them? 
So, so far I haven't told you how we choose them. The only thing that's important is we have to choose them so that their null cones are disjoint. They don't intersect each other and they don't intersect the null cone of the physical metric. So they have to form this nested set uh, in the cotangent space like this. So here the, the purple is the null cone of the physical metric and then orange and green are the null cones of the two um, unphysical metrics. This is in the cotangent space. If we go to the tangent space, it reverses the order of the nesting. And so the physical metric is now the outermost cone and then the two unphysical metrics are, are inside it. So in this case, the, the physical degrees of freedom would be the fastest degrees of freedom. So with this choice, one can prove that the conventional two derivative GR is strongly hyperbolic in our, in our formulation. It's also straightforward to include a conventional, just minimally coupled scalar field at the two derivative level. Um, and so um, in this two derivative theory, uh, since it's strongly hyperbolic, this matrix is diagonalizable with real eigenvalues. But because we now introduce these, these extra cones uh, to separate the speeds of these unphysical modes, um, we've eliminated the degeneracy of the eigenvalues in this matrix. And so that was, that was the problem before. We've now eliminated that problem. And so one can show that when we now include the four derivative terms in the action, this matrix remains diagonalizable with real eigenvalues when we turn on the deformation to, uh, to include these four derivative terms. And so this means that at weak coupling, when these four derivative terms are small, this formulation, this, this modified harmonic gauge gives us strongly hyperbolic equations. And so the initial value problem for these theories is well posed in this, in this gauge, with this gauge fixing. Um, how do we choose these unphysical metrics? As I said, the only important thing is that their, their null cones are nested in this way relative to the, the physical metric. If you're doing a numerical simulation, uh, then you have some foliation by constant time slices. If we choose n to be the unit normal to those time slices, we can define g tilde, we could choose g tilde and g hat uh, like this, where A and B are just some constants. As long as A and B satisfy this inequality, um, then uh, you'll get this nesting of, of cones that, that, that we need for, for, for the well posedness. So that, that's one way of choosing them. There are, there are many other ways one we can do it. As I mentioned earlier, the first numerical simulations have now been performed in this, in this uh, framework for using these theories. So East and Ripley have done numerical simulations in, in this theory. So this is um, just, Einstein gravity coupled to a massless scalar field, and then including this four derivative uh, coupling between the, the scalar field and, uh, and curvature. Um, so um, the, um, uh, the, 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 as I said, the, the, this term here is an example of a term that, that we saw earlier would give you um, uh, where, where curvature acts as a source for the scalar field. So this is an example where, where black holes uh, will, will form scalar hair. So what, one thing they studied in their numerics was scalarization of rotating black holes, where you start off with a black hole with no hair present and then watch it, watch it turn on dynamically. They also went on and studied more impressive things like collisions of black holes head on and indeed in spiral and merger. Uh, the parameter which measures whether one is in the weakly coupled regime or not is, is this parameter here where M is the um, uh, the mass of the smaller of the black holes present, and that, that went up to about 0 0.2 in, the, in their theories, which is small enough to uh, ensure that these theories still remain strongly hyperbolic. Um, some generalizations. Uh, so our modified harmonic gauge will give us well-posed equations for any weakly coupled Hondesky theory. Um, it also works for weakly coupled Lovelock theories. So I mentioned earlier this einstein gauss bonnet theory, which gives the leading order EFT corrections to vacuum gravity in the higher dimensions. And so that means we now opened up the possibility of studying the effects of these um, four derivative corrections on dynamical processes in higher dimensional gravity. So one could now perhaps perform um, numerical simulations of the, of the black string instability, Gregory Laflamme instability, uh, and study the effect of these higher curvature terms on that, on that process. Um, the other effective field theory I mentioned is the, effect, is the Einstein Maxwell effective field theory. So, this is the most recent work that I worked with, with my student Ian Davis was to, to show that all of this works in that case as well. Um, where now we need to put a gauge condition on the, on the Maxwell field on, the, on the, the potential A. And there's a natural way of extending that, of using our 
um, well, there's an obvious way of, of using these uh, uh, unto unphysical metrics to, to modify the, the Lorentz gauge condition in the same way that we modified the, uh, the harmonic gauge condition for the, for the metric. Okay, so that's, that's basically the end of the, the part of the talk where I tell you about well posedness in these, in these effective field theories. So in the last um, few minutes, let me tell you about um, something a bit different, which is um, causality in these uh, gravitational theories with these uh, four derivative uh, effective field theory terms. So it, um, causality of a partial differential equa equation is determined by, by its characteristic surfaces. Um, so, um, a simple example of this would be the wave equation. So, for the wave equation, um, a surface is characteristic if and only if it is null. Uh, and similarly for, for Maxwell's equations, uh, hopefully this is this is familiar to, to most people. Uh, and also for the Einstein equation, if we look at the gauge fixed Einstein equation, if we're working in some strongly hyperbolic formulation then the characteristic surfaces associated with the physical degrees of freedom are null. And that's basically the statement that the gravitational waves propagate along the, uh, the null cone of the, of the metric. Gravity travels at the speed of light. So hopefully that's all familiar. So in these, in these examples, a surface is characteristic if and only if it's normal size, this is the normal to our, to our surface, uh, is null. It satisfies this condition here. And of course, this defines a cone. Uh, which we'll call the characteristic cone in the in the cotangent space at, at any point of, of our space time. And of course, in these examples, this is the same thing as the null cone of the of the inverse metric. Let's now think about these effective field theories we've been discussing. Um, so in these theories, it's it's been known for some time that the characteristics uh, need not be null. So this was first studied in 88 for, for, for Lovelock theories by Shoke Bruat. Um, so if they're not null, then what can we say about the properties of the, of the characteristic cone uh, in a general uh, weakly coupled background in these theories? So that, that's the question um, I set out to answer in my, in my paper from about a year ago. And so the idea is that, whoops, um, if one is looking just at physical characteristics, which is all we'll be looking at, then there's a nice approach one can use, which is independent of any gauge fixing procedure. So let me describe that, how that works just for, for standard GR. So in standard GR, um, if we fix um, um, some background solution, and um, we consider the Einstein equation linearized around that background solution, we'll get something like this. So this is the, the linearized Einstein equation. The dots here are terms with fewer than two derivatives. And this P here is just something built from the, the inverse metric. Um, from this equation, we can read off an important object, the so-called principal symbol, which is used to define what we mean by a characteristic surface. So the definition of the principal symbol is the following. Given a covector psi, we can track this P with two psi's, and we get an object with four indices. That thing is basically the principal symbol. And you view this as a, as a, as a matrix which acts on uh, symmetric tensors, T mu nu. So View this as a, as a matrix which acts on symmetric objects, T mu nu, which you can think of as polarization vectors associated with, with gravitational waves. Okay, so this is a, a matrix which takes a symmetric tensor and gives us another symmetric tensor. Now the diffeomorphism invariance of, of, of GR implies that um, there's a residual, there's a, there's a kind of a gauge symmetry present at the level of this principal symbol, which works as follows. If we take T mu nu to be of this form, so it's a symmetrized product of psi with a, an arbitrary covector x, then this always lies in the kernel of, of the principal symbol. Okay. And because of that, one can regard the principal symbol as acting on equivalent classes, t mu nu, under this equivalence relation. So you can think of this as a, as a linearized gauge transformation uh, in, this, in this language. So such classes, these equivalence classes, correspond to physical polarizations. The polarizations mod gauge transformations, if you like. And so finally, we say that, that the covector psi is, is a physical characteristic if there exists a non-trivial class T, which lies in the kernel of P of psi. So that's, that's the definition of what we mean by a, by a characteristic in this, in this gauge invariant uh, framework. 
And you can show for standard GR, this is just an algebraic problem and it's quite easy to show that, 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 that the solution of this problem is that Xi has to be null. So we just recover the, the statement, the characteristic surfaces are null. Um, you can also work out what the polarizations are that satisfy this condition when Xi is null. And they're precisely uh, the transverse tensors where transverse means uh, this condition here. Uh, is, is, the, is the principal symbol a kind of projection operator? Um, it's not really a projection, no. It's more, if you like, it's, 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 it corresponds to the high frequency part of the equations of motion. If you're doing geometric optics, this will be the part you retain in the geometric optics approximation. So yeah, geometric, if you were doing geometric optics, you would get precisely this equation here to specify the weight. So psi would be the wave vector in geometric optics, which you can sort of see going from here to here, replacing derivatives with psi's. And this equation here will be the, the equation which determines the wave vector. So it fixes the, the dispersion relation, you know. So that, that's one way of getting to, getting to this. Um, equation. Any other questions? Okay, um, so this was all just for standard GR. We just recovered what we already knew that things that the, the, the characteristics are null. But the, the point is that this approach can be extended to any um, diffeomorphism. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> any diffeomorphism invariant uh, equation of motion. Um, any, any theory with a diffeomorphism equation of motion, uh, such as Lovelock, Kondesky, or the various effective field theories I've been talking about. I mean, when we include matter fields, such as a scalar field or a Maxwell field and so on, we have to enlarge our definition of the principal symbol so that it also acts on the matter field. So it, we have to view it as acting on some bigger thing. So it's not just the, the gravitational polarization, there's also some matter related polarization here, but that's, that's um, you can do all of that. Um, the difficulty is that the principal symbol in these theories with four derivative terms in the equations of motion is pretty complicated. So for GR, this just depended on the metric, but now this depends on the metric, any matter field, and their first and second derivatives. So it would also depend, for example, on the, on the Riemann tensor. And that means solving this equation in a general weakly coupled background is, in general, is gonna be very hard. Um, but Remarkably, I think it turns out you can actually do this um, for the, the Einstein scalar case. So if we look at the Einstein scalar effective field theory I described, or, or even the, the general Kondesky theories, you can actually solve this completely, uh, well, you can solve it in, in, in generality in an arbitrary background and fully characterize the, the wave vectors uh, satisfying this equation. So that was the main result in my, in my paper. So let me describe it in, in, uh, in, in words. Um, so we're looking at Einstein scalar theory. So we have three physical degrees of freedom. So there are two graviton and one scalar field degree of freedom. We're in four dimensions here. So what I show is that, is that psi, an arbitrary covector psi is characteristic if it satisfies this equation here, where P is a homogeneous polynomial of degree six. And the coefficients in this polynomial uh, depend on the, the background fields and their, their first and second derivatives. I should say in, in GR, well, if you have a system with second order equations, generally you expect um, um, a quadratic equation for, for each degree of freedom. Here we have um, three degrees of freedom, and three times two is six. And so this degree six is kind of the, is the minimal you would expect uh, in order to characterize covectors that are characteristic. This is, a, in, in a sense, it's not an optimal result. One would not expect to do better than this. So there's a, a, an explicit formula for this P, but it's too complicated for me to write it down, so I won't, because it depends on all the, on the, all the fields. Um, but I can start tell you something about it. So a weak coupling, this defines a cone, this, this condition, and that cone has three sheets corresponding to the three physical degrees of freedom. And each sheet corresponds to a different physical polarization of this theory. In general, the polarizations, the graviton and the scalar polarizations all mix up, but um, one can disentangle them at the level of this, um, of this cone and, and, and describe which polarization propagates along each sheet of the cone. And the weak coupling, when the background fields are weak, this, this cone, the three sheets of this cone, as one would expect, are all close to the, 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 the null cone of, of the metric. And so, although things don't propagate exactly at the speed of light, they propagate almost at the speed of light at weak coupling. 
Um, in fact, there's a bit more structure present, which is that this degree six polynomial act actually factorizes into a product of quartic and quadratic polynomials, um, which amusingly is quite similar to what happens in elasticity theory. If you look at waves in an, in an anisotropic elastic solid with hexagonal symmetry, for example, zinc, then you, that's also described by a characteristic polynomial of degree six, which factorizes into a quadratic and a quartic. Um, so in these theories, you could say that the universe is a bit like zinc um, in some sense. Um, the, the quadratic polynomial here is associated with a purely gravitational polarization, it turns out. And, and this, is, this is true for a generic background. If you look at special theories, so this is, this is true for a general theory in this class, if you look at special theories, or if you look at very symmetrical backgrounds such as F, FLRW, then things can factorize further. For example, if you look at FLRW, this would factorize into a product of three uh, quadratics. Um, you can visualize this cone by taking a cross section through it. In the elasticity literature, this, this cross section is called a slowness surface. So um, these three sheets will give us these, these, three, um, these, these three circles, three ellipses in, the, in this cross section. So this is, this is what they look like. You can show that the, the sheets touch at, at two points like this. Um, maybe I, I'm running out of time, so I won't describe the difference between the left and the right. Um, this is all in the cotangent space. In the cotangent space, the fastest degrees of freedom are associated with the inner surface here. Uh, so the region inside that is called, in the mathematics literature, that, that, that region is called the Garden Cone. If you're interested in causality, then you want to work in the, in the tangent space rather than the cotangent space. And then the, the, the relevant cone in the tangent space is the dual of this Garden Cone. So one we'll has to take the dual of the cone associated with this region, and that defines a cone in the tangent space, which you can then use to make all of the definitions that you, you want to make in, in causal structure. So for example, you would use that cone to define what you mean by a black hole. Um, and maybe one could use that, uh, that notion of causality to try and prove things about, um, or try and prove theorems in these theories uh, involving black holes or singularity theorems or, or that kind of thing. But that, that's, at the moment, that's a hope rather than, a, than something that's, that's actually been done yet. Anyway, let me, let me end. To summarize, um, I've explained how effective field theory is an attractive formalism for parameterizing possible strong field deviations from GR. I've explained various theories where we can use field redefinitions to write the leading effective field theory corrections in a way uh, where the equations of motion are still second order. I've told you that we need uh, oh, to do numerical simulations. We need to find a strongly hyperbolic uh, way of writing the equations um, so that we have a well-posed initial value problem. I've explained how we found the first example of such a formulation for this class of theories based on this, this modified harmonic gauge. So we have well-posedness at weak coupling and the first numerical simulations of black hole mergers have now been done in, in some of these theories using our, our formulation. And then at the end, I just described a formalism for determining the physical characteristics of any gravitational theory with second order equations of motion. And one can use this to completely solve the problem of uh, determining the um, characteristics for the scalar tensor effective field theories, or indeed any Horndesky theory, where we have to we, we can reduce it to looking at this, this polynomial of, of degree six. Um, so in future work, a generalization of this would be to go to um, the Einstein-Maxwell effect of field theory, where one has four degrees of freedom. And so one would now expect a degree eight polynomial instead of a degree six polynomial. That's something that, that my student and I have thought about, but we've got a bit stuck on it. I mean, at the moment, we, we've got a degree 10 polynomial. We haven't figured out how to get to a degree eight polynomial. Um, but more, more interestingly is, is whether we can use this structure, this characterization of causality in these theories to actually prove anything interesting. So as I said, one can use this, these, these cones to define what you mean by a black hole in these theories. Um, can you use it to prove anything interesting about those black holes? For example, do, do they satisfy an area law? Um, can, one, can one prove a singularity theorem in these theories? Um, that kind of thing. So, so that, that's the kind of way, direction that, that I, I think would be interesting to, to explore in the future. But um, uh, that's where I will end today. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Riel, for such a nice and illuminating seminar. Is there any question uh, from the audience? Uh, can I ask a couple of questions, please? Um, I've been asking questions, so if you pardon me. No, no please, you're very welcome. Okay, thank you very much. To the extent I understood, there's a lot of details I have to figure out. Uh, I was just wondering, your characterization of the criterion uh, for the existence of the initial value problem was, of course, the criterion of strong hyperbolicity. Now, that's an algebraic analytic criterion, as you very well explained. I was wondering if that is related to um, the idea of the, the geometric idea of global hyperbolicity. I mean, that, uh, is there a relationship between the two? Um, well, there, there is a connection in the sense that well, the, the global hyperbolicity is, is more about characterizing domains of dependence. So it's, it's, it's characterizing if you're given initial data which admits a well posed initial value problem, right, right. then what, what is the largest um, space time or, or solution that you can right. construct right. starting from existence the initial of data? surfaces, yeah. Existence of yeah, exactly. So, 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 so I say global hyperbolicity comes next. So you start with the, yes, yeah, so the word global is important, right? So global hyperbolicity is a global thing. We're asking Absolutely. about global problems. Yes. Well, the strong hyperbolicity is really a local thing. We're just asking about local well posedness, which is really mm -hmm. just the question of if we're given some initial data, mm -hmm. can we evolve it for any non zero amount of time? Can we just evolve it one time step effectively? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that's, that's the notion of local well posedness, whereas global hyperbolicity is more relevant to global uniqueness, uh, which is more of a, if you like, a global notion of well posedness. So it's, 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 a, it's a, that, I mean, there should be some notion of global hyperbolicity for these theories, which you would define using the kind of causal structure I've just described at the end of my right. talk. Right. That, 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 yeah, that is that's the root of the question. Uh, but I would, I mean, I would like to know which, is, according to you, is the stronger criteria. I mean, or I would say which, which is, which is. In, in your case, of course, your research is based on the uh, strong hyperbolicity. I can see that very well. But on the other hand, is global hyperbolicity uh, included, subsumed, or is it something that that would mean something more? So, well, so strong hyperbolicity is a condition on the equations, whereas global hyperbolicity is a condition on solutions of those equations. Right. So it's characterizing um, what is the biggest region of a solution within which the solution is unique. Okay. So, so they, they are distinct, distinct, distinct notions. Okay, very good. Uh, just curious about this nested, I mean, in your way of um, uh, modifying the harmonic gauge condition by introducing two auxiliary metrics, you had this nesting with an ordering. Mm -hmm. uh, was the ordering very crucial uh, in the sense that if A and B, the inequality were reversed, would, would that um, imply no? Yeah, so no was, that's a good question. So, so there, there was one, I think one of the orderings wasn't important. Um, and I'm trying to remember which it was. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think we want anything that's space-like with respect to the physical metric to also be space-like with respect to the unphysical metrics. Uh -huh. So we want the physical metric to be the outermost cone. Um, but there was an ordering of the other two cones, which was important, but I, I've forgotten which, which, uh, which way around it was now, I'm afraid. But th this was related to this thing, uh, the topic I didn't say much about, which is whether the, um, if you have initial data satisfying the gauge condition, whether the gauge condition propagates. Mm -hmm. uh, in order for that to be true, you, I think you want your cones to be nested in a certain way. I think you need right. G, G hat and G have to be related in this way, I think. But I think there was there was some, yeah, the, I think the ordering of, of two of the cones relative to the third was fixed, but there was there was one, it wasn't completely fixed, the ordering. I mean, in, in, in the sense that these both these auxiliary metrics are like projections, right? I mean, uh, they're projections onto the uh, uh, space-like hypersurface. And uh, no, so, the, no, so there's an ordering that, that you wish to uh, impose. No they're, not, no, they're not projections, they're, they're Lorentzian metrics. Um, these are not projections, right? So I'm not choosing a. If I so I'm not choosing a and b to be. I mean, if 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 a were one, then these would be projections. right. That, that would be projection. You're right. Yeah, I, so so not, not a and b think of them as small numbers. Um, so th these are not projections. These are Lorentzian metrics. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And uh, what was, anyway, I've forgotten the last question I had. Thanks very much indeed, Professor. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. 
Yeah, yeah, you, men you mentioned that uh, you have got the uh, four simulations uh, based on your, uh, uh, your results. So uh, the simulations produce the waveforms? Yes. Well, I mean, they, they, they were preliminary simulations, so they didn't, they weren't trying to produce templates or anything. They just, it was more a proof of principle that they could do um, in spiral and merger. And I think the plan was to return later and, and do a more systematic study. But the, so yeah, they, I think they did one or two uh, in spiral and merger simulations. Oh, the reason I asked is that how much do they differ from the usual GR? Well, I, I mean, uh, one thing I should emphasize- any, uh, estimate or- Well, you, you've, I mean, you already see, I'd say that there's kind of a zero order difference, which is that you've got this scalar field, which is sourced by the black holes. And so, as well as gravitational radiation, you also see scalar field radiation. And so that, that's gonna cause, already cause a deviation from GR. Um, and how, how big a deviation you see is going to be determined by the size of this, of this coupling, well, so the size of this, this parameter here, right? So the, big, the bigger this is, the, the bigger the deviation. And so, as, as I said earlier, uh, the, way, the way I think about this is you should think of, maybe one could think of um, what gravitational wave observation should be trying to do is place upper bounds on, on quantities like this. And the, the better the upper bound, the, the, the better the test of GR. Um, uh, also here, the characteristics of the gravitational waves themselves are not changed, right? Say that again, sorry? The, 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 the gravitational waves still continue to be uh, transverse and uh, two polarizations and so on. Sorry, you broke up, you're breaking up a little bit. I didn't hear your question very oh. clearly. Uh, I'm asking that the gravitational waves still continue to be quadrupolar, right? Are they what the gravitational waves are? Quadrupolar. Quadrupolar, oh yes. Um, I mean, that characteristic doesn't change. There is no qualitative um, change. Yeah, I think, I think that's correct. I mean, yeah, at least to leading order. Um, I don't think that any, I mean, you've got, of course, you've now got the scalar field as well. So you've got yes. monopole scalar field weight radiation, but um, yeah, I, I don't think that's going to change. So, so yeah, since this is considered as, in a sense, perturbative, you don't expect the leading term to change much qualitatively. It's not going to change much, but the point is, I mean, if you want to, place upper bounds on this when the field is strongest, it's at the moment of merger. Yeah, there will be deviations, of course, yes. Yeah, yeah. Should be, yes. Uh, and one other comment I want to make, uh, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. The global hyperbolicity doesn't quite refer to any equation of motion as such. It is only a statement about given any pseudo Riemannian manifold. If you have the Cauchy surface, a surface whose domain of dependence is defined entirely in terms of uh, forward and backward light cones, which don't particularly care about what the Geminus, what equation the Geminus satisfies. So that's no, I agree. I agree. Uh, compared to the notion that you're using. In well, this no, but the, yeah, but the reason is the question is why is that relevant for solutions of the initial value problem? And there it is relevant that the, the null cone of the metric, which is what you're talking about, is the same as the characteristic cone, which is where the, the relation to the equation of motion comes in. Okay, so the fact that the characteristic cone is the null cone of the metric is the reason why the domain of dependence using the null cone of the metric is the thing that's relevant for the uh, initial value problem in, in GI. In other words, the statement that you have a unique maximal development and so on. So it's that connection which is important. Okay. So, so in these more general theories I, I've been talking about, the notion of global hyperbolicity defined using the null cone of the metric would not be very relevant because it has no connection to the equation. You, you would instead have to define global hyperbolicity using the characteristic cone that I've, I've described. And uh, one small question uh, about your definition of uh, strong hyperbolicity. You invoke that the uh, matrix uh, M times I has to be diagonalizable. Uh, what was the reason for that? Yeah. This, uh, um, okay. So, so the way to see that is that if, if this were not diagonalizable, then you could write it in Jordan normal form and then calculate this exponential. And you would then see that the result actually um, was polynomial in psi. Okay. It's not obvious just looking at it, you have to do the calculation, but you'll find that the result is polynomial in psi if you do that calculation. And it comes from the non-trivial Jordan block. So, so, I mean, the simplest thing to do would just take a two by two matrix, okay. yeah. which, which is a non-trivial Jordan, I don't know, lambda one, lambda or something like that, and calculate its exponent and you'll see it's, it's polynomial in psi. Now, I was just thinking in terms of singular value decomposition instead of exact diagonalizability. Yeah. Um, yeah, the point so is that diagonalized. That is why I <laughs> no, yeah, the point, 
point is a generic matrix, well, a yeah. generic matrix is not diagonalizable. Right, so right. It's, uh, yeah. It's okay. a fragile property of matrices, but but sure. the theory gives you the extra structure you need to rescue that fragi fragility. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Riel and also Professor Date. Uh, maybe I just have one question and maybe we can end with it if the audience has no further questions. Uh, may I have one or two questions. Can I ask one? Though? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So, uh, Harvey, thanks for this uh, wonderful talk. So, I have two questions. First, uh, there are these causality constraints, which uh, many people have been raising for uh, theories beyond general relativity. So, I wonder whether this well posedness has anything to do with this causality constraints. That would be the, what do you think? I don't think so. Um, I mean, the causality constraints that people talk about, I mean, there are various different things, but what one thing, I mean, there's a famous paper by Kamano, Edelstein, Maldacena, and Jibodov, where, where I think they're basically asking the question whether, mostly in the ADS context, of whether you can send signals from the ADS boundary and back through the bulk and back to the boundary within a time that would look superluminal from the perspective of the boundary. And okay, in these theories, some of these theories, you probably can do that. Um, and so, presumably, these theories would not be candidates for theories which admit a CFT dual where that CFT is a conventional kind of quantum field theory. Okay, but from the classical perspective, there's nothing wrong with these, the, these theories in the, in the sense that I've been describing. You can set up initial data and evolve it. I mean, obviously, there are other things you might want your theory to, to do classically. You might want it to have a positive energy theorem, for example. Um, uh, that, that's something else that, that, that one might go wrong. Um, but, um, but I mean, the, the zeroth order thing I think you'd want from your classical theory is, is well posedness of the initial value problem. And that, that, that I think is, is okay. So another related question would be that, uh, so uh, in many of these theories, since the graviton characteristics will be different from the photon. So therefore, in a sense, the event horizon in general will differ, it depends on the species, like right? whether you are looking at the photon or you're looking at the horizon, uh, the graviton. So, Correct. Yeah, that, that, that's precisely what this um, yeah. this comment at the end was um, referring to. So let's say we do it for this scalar field case. Maybe it's a bit clearer. Um, in the scalar field case, we have three degrees of freedom, and, and you can't say that that two of them are graviton and one is scalar field because actually they're all mixed up. So there's some combination of graviton okay. and the same in the, with okay. the photon case. So what you have to do is look at the fastest degree of freedom, which is this okay. innermost cone. And then take its dual cone in the tangent space, okay, okay. and that's the thing you should use to define causality. Okay, so that that's that's the cone that, that's associated with the fastest mode, if you like. So if you define what you mean by a black hole using that cone, then that's the definition which says nothing can get out, which is so that's the reason that's causally disconnected from infinity. And one would like to um, uh, prove the area law or anything like that on that such a cone. Yeah, of course, it won't be an area law because these are higher derivative theories. So you, you'd be looking at. I mean, maybe, I mean the entropy yeah, law. What I yeah, mean. You, yeah, exactly. Well, that, that's this is this is just a speculation. I mean, I know various people, perhaps including you, have, have, uh, have thought about what, what you need to do in these in these um, higher derivative theories to to get a second law of black hole mechanics. And one thing that I don't think anybody has tried. Um, well, well, I'm trying it at the moment, but <laughs> with limited success, I should say, but it is, is, is to work on a characteristic surface rather than working on a null surface. Um, in other words, define the horizon in the way I've just described and try and prove something about that horizon. Um, it turns out to be quite difficult to, uh, to make much progress, but... but um, Maybe one could do an easier thing, think of a kind of a Vaidya black hole and then Consider the event horizon of a white black hole and the characteristics cone of the other species. Yeah, the, the problem is that when you do that, you're going into spherical symmetry. And in spherical okay. symmetry, you lose a lot of this richness okay. and structure, and things kind of become degenerate or trivial. Um, so, a lot of what I've said, well, not all of them. The point is, spherically symmetric space times are non generic. And okay. most I, of what I've I, said it applies to generic space times. Um, um, and, uh, but also, I think it's fairly clear you can, there, there are situations where you might be able to prove things in spherical symmetry, but not know how they would extend beyond spherical symmetry. Thank yeah. you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shurukrada. Uh, so the final question that I had in mind is that you mentioned in the future to look for Einstein-Maxwell theories. Uh, now we know that if we have a charge, electromagnetic charge in an asymptotically de Sitter space-time, then uh, there are violations of the strong cosmic censorship conjecture, and which in turn uh, leads to a violation of the hyperbolicity. So do you think that asymptotic structure of space-time will affect the program that you have in the case of Einstein-Maxwell theory? Um, well, I mean, as I said, I don't think these two things are the same thing. So the, the, the notion of hyperbolicity I'm talking about is a local thing, which is a, a property of the equations, whereas the notion you're talking about is the global hyperbolicity, which is more a property of solutions of those equations. Um, of course, you could ask, you could ask about black hole solutions of these theories that I've been describing. Um, probably someone has studied the analog of Reister Nordstrom de Sitter in, in uh, where is it, in, in, uh, in this kind of theory. Um, uh, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, in, in the context of these violations of strong cosmic censorship, which, which is something I mean, uh, maybe you know, I worked on this recently. Um, you see these violations at the classical level for Rice and Nordstrom to Sitter, but then um, Stefan Hollands, Bob Wald, and collaborators showed that, that yes, the, yes. this is so, saved by quantum field theory effects. So, so but, uh, this analysis is, uh, but this analysis is purely classical, right? You are solving the classical field equation, not the semi classical ones. Well, there are two things. If you, so, first, make it clear to the rest of the audience we're now talking about something different from, from the rest of the talk. So, so firstly, the statement that Rice and Nordstrom de Sitter leads to a violation of strong cosmic censorship is a purely classical statement. It's a statement about the behavior yeah. of small classical perturbations of Rice and Nordstrom de Sitter. Um, but then the second statement is that quantum field theory um, rescues that violation of the conjecture because when you study vacuum polarization of quantum fields in the Rice and Nordstrom de Sitter spacetime, you find that the, um, the stress tends to diverges at the Cauchy horizon inside the black hole, which means in a way which is sufficiently strong, such that when you were, if you were to include semi-classical back reaction, it would destroy the Cauchy horizon and that, that would then restore uh, strong cosmic censorship. Um, but just to emphasize that's, that's not really related to, to the subject of today's talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Riel, for such a nice uh, talk and thanks to all the participants as well. I think today we'll end our session and uh, thanking all the participants and once again thanking Professor Riel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you all. Thank you. Yeah.